Welcome, my friends. Kevin Shirka here, the Indiana Jones nerd yet again. So I have just seen about 20 minutes of new footage from Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. By the time you guys are seeing this, much of that footage would have been released during the opening night of Gamescom. And now we're going to do a thorough breakdown of everything we saw in this footage, both from an Indiana Jones perspective and from a video gaming perspective. Massive thank you first off to Machine Games and Bethesda for not only making this game, but for inviting me and other content creators to see footage early. Guys, I am really convinced now that this game is going to make you feel and think like Indiana Jones. In every way, this is shaping up to be a very welcome and well-crafted addition to the Indiana Jones franchise. The video starts with an almost two-minute clip of Indy finding a small statuette of perhaps Horus or Anubis in an underground chamber in Egypt. There is a nice character moment here as he reluctantly has to destroy the priceless artifact, revealing one of the mysterious stones that he is after inside. You guys have already seen bits of this scene in prior trailers. The chamber begins filling with sand and Indy has to make a daring escape. We then get a good 9 minutes or so of many brief clips accompanied by narration from a developer. So many great visuals here which are perfectly suited for Indiana Jones. A shot of Indy navigating a narrow passage of ancient Egyptian corpses, shots of Indy grabbing his gear at Marshall College, yet another brief single shot recreating the Peru opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and more. The footage jumps around a lot in the timeline, but I'm going to try and talk about things in the order of the story itself in order to keep this organized. According to the developer, our story begins in Marshall College on the night of a break-in in 1937. Indy encounters a giant named Locus. The next morning, we get more first-person gameplay of Indy at Marshall College as he prepares to embark on his adventure. There's a map of the college, which I might mention does not match the deleted scene from Raiders of Lost Ark, showing Indy's classroom being across the hallway from a large lecture hall. But the map seems to include Indy's office, classroom, and the museum, where two large Lamassu type statues flank the entrance. Opening up Indy's journal reveals mission objectives and clues. This journal is one of Indy's most important tools in the game. It is going to be mostly blank at the start of the game and will fill up with maps, notes, pictures, and more that you can consult throughout the game. First of all, wow, I was so thrilled to see that Indy's journal contains the map to the Temple of the Forbidden Eye, which was created by Disney Imagineer Chuck Ballou for the 1995 Disneyland attraction. There are several other possible references to non-film indie works in this gameplay, and it makes me so excited to see that the developers are making this game with love, putting in the research to make you feel like you are Indiana Jones in a living and breathing world that is not detached from his other adventures. Now, back to the journal. We get a few other clues from the mission objectives shown when he opens the journal. Apparently, the item stolen from the museum was a mummified cat which was recently found in Siwa. Now, this might conflict with my theory that I mentioned in a recent video, namely that the stones Indy gives Marcus in Raiders of the Lost Ark are connected to the Great Circle. But it doesn't necessarily rule out that theory either. Now, luckily the museum had already taken a picture of the cat which Indy puts in his journal. We also learned that Locus, referred only as the giant at this point in the game, has left behind a pendant pointing to the Vatican, which seems like the best place for Indy to go and try and get the cat mummy back. A later journal entry confirms that Locus will stop at nothing to prevent the Great Circle Stones from being found. Before leaving though, Indy has to pack his suitcase with his bullwhip, the giant's pendant, and a rhythm and blues gramophone record. Possibly a reference to Mystery of the Blues, which established Indy's passion for the musical genre, both as a listener and participant. By the end of this section of the game, the page in Indy's journal with the Forbidden Eye map has added information pertaining to the Pendant and the Cat Mummy, his Marshall College identity card, and an article on Black Shirts, the paramilitary wing of the Italian Fascist Party which indicates to the player that it is okay to beat up the Italian enemies that you will find in the next section of the game. Another important part of Indy's gear is his camera. When you take a picture of something in the world, Indy will comment on it, providing historical insights and clues. He also has a lighter, though it is not the same Lucky Charm lighter seen in Last Crusade. 
We see Indy use it to light a torch and then use the torch to clear debris from a passageway. The developer describes that you will have to use your gear in clever and unexpected ways. The footage gave many examples of how you, the player, are going to have to think like Indy to find solutions. One great moment showed Indy exploring the ledges of a dark canyon. When rocks rain down and collapse his path, he picks up a spear and chucks it into an adjacent wall, creating a support that he can whip and swing across with. More familiar ideas return from the films. For one, Indy and his ally Gina will have many friends and allies around the world to help them in each location. They showed an ally in Egypt who was surprisingly not Sala, but a new character named Dame Nawal Shafiq Barclay. Another new ally was a colorful eyepatch wearing warrior woman in Thailand. And in the Vatican itself, Indy was helped by Antonio, an old friend in the clergy. Antonio refers to Indy as Henri, a reference to his World War I era nickname in Young Indiana Jones, suggesting that Indy and Antonio first met during the Great War. Antonio provides Indy with a clerical suit allowing him to explore sections of the Vatican without raising suspicion. This is another familiar returning idea from the films, and we see that in the Egypt section of the game he donned the same disguise he wore at the Tanis dig site. After Indy mentions his encounter with Locus, Antonio tells him about rumored giants known as the Fallen Angels hiding in the Holy City. We had heard the name Fallen Angels mentioned in a previous trailer, and now we're getting some more context. So apparently Locus isn't the only such giant. And what's with the name Fallen Angels? Are they a race of humans or even humanoids that come from a remote part of the world? Or dare I say, even outer space or heaven itself? I'm curious to the origins and backstory of this faction. So Indy goes into the subterranean levels of the Vatican in search of the scribblings of a mad Catholic priest who was raving about the giants. At one point, he encounters a statue of Longinus, whose Holy Lance was a plot element in both Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny and Indiana Jones and the Spear of Destiny. He eventually meets Gina, who we learn is an Italian journalist and, as we know, the main companion in the game. Gina is on a quest to find her sister. As we've seen in previous trailers, they reach the Vatican treasure room where they find the mummified cat, but they have to hide upon the arrival of Nazi Emmerich Voss, along with several goons and a German-speaking Catholic priest. The Nazis break several relics, revealing mysterious stones inside, and the priest warns Voss of the dangers he has been told of these relics, which contain forces not of this earth. This is how Indy realizes that the theft of the cat mummy was only part of a wider conspiracy. Neither Indy nor Gina believe in superstition, but Voss does, and they realize that they have no choice but to stop him. So that eventually leads Indy to Egypt, where we were shown several minutes of additional gameplay of the Egypt section of the game that will not be shown to the public at Gamescom. A map of Egypt in Indy's journal gives us a good hint about the size of some of these levels. The distances aren't 100% proportional to the real Giza, but this gives you some idea about the size of the playable map. We can see the pyramids of Giza towering over different sections of the map as Indy explores the level. Some parts of this game have an open world quality, and this map contains not only the Sphinx and German campsites, but also sections of the nearby town, which Indy can explore for clues or optional side missions, which reward the player with adventure points. An idea originating in the classic point-and-click adventure games Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, which featured Indy Quotient points. Though, in the case of the Great Circle, these adventure points are used to expand your skill set. We see Indy exploring the Vatican at daytime and a market in Cairo where he can interact with vendors. The market is colorful and authentic looking, and there's even a monkey wearing a vest like the one in Raiders. The player will have choices in how they want to approach situations. You can use your whip to access hidden routes, roll a bottle to distract the guards and sneak by, or engage head on. We see that Indy can use his whip to disarm enemies, trip them, or draw them close for a killing blow. We also see a fight where he blocks with his right arm before throwing a punch with his left. We see grabs, shoves, and parries as well. It seems like the game will have a thorough fighting system where you have a dedicated button for each fist, or using your whip, and so on. And as in previous games, you can use your environment or pick up items or enemy weapons to help in a fight. 
This makes the gameplay seem very robust, satisfying, and immersive. Perhaps even more so than Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb, which had the franchise's best gameplay and mechanics thus far. Indicators at the bottom of the screen reveal Indy's health and stamina in fights, more evidence that Indy's graphic adventures were ahead of their time. Like with many of Bethesda's games, Indy will find magazines scattered around the world. In this game, they are called adventure books. Picking up one of these will allow Indy to use his adventure points to purchase a new permanent ability or upgrade. For example, through Grit is a revival ability. When Indy is defeated in combat, he will drop his fedora and have a short amount of time to crawl over and pick it up and revive himself to continue the fight. Returning to the topic of the Giza mission, let's walk you through the entire 8 minute gameplay segment which was shown exclusively behind closed doors. After accomplishing some of his prior objectives and beating up some pesky Nazis, Indy meets Gina in a small room below the Sphinx, and Gina has apparently given him a new nickname, Strombo. There is a door here which they are trying to open, and Indy discovers that the key is a golden medallion which the Nazis have found and taken to their recreational area. Donning his white Arab disguise from Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indy goes to the recreation area, where he eventually finds the medallion but has to make sure to fetch a bottle of wine for an officer to avoid suspicion. This officer is Meyer, who, as we learned from the earlier note, has taken command of the excavation only two days prior. This is a great example of how rich the story world is, with secondary characters in each section of the game who have their own personality and backstory. I also noticed some movie posters in the tent including Nord Cairo Express, which features a character dressed like Indiana Jones. Indy returns to the Sphinx and unlocks the door to an underground level, unexplored for thousands of years. He uses his lighter and whip to help them advance through the various chambers. I should note that Indy's journal mentions the Egypt section of the game having to do with the Sanctuary of the Guardians. And at this point, Indy and Gina find a mural of three Egyptian gods who they identify as the Guardians. They look like Egyptian gods, but I don't know their exact identity. There is a man, a woman, and one bird-headed figure like Horus or Anubis. I wonder if these guardians are the ancestors of the giant fallen angels, perhaps? They then enter a chamber where they have to rotate several mirrors to shine light and unlock a golden mask. Gina speculates that the guardians looked so frightening that they had to wear masks to cover their faces. I wonder if this is yet another hint connecting the Guardians to the Fallen Angels, or perhaps something more supernatural? Gina sits on the throne, setting off a trap, and they encounter a swarm of scorpions. The gameplay then concludes with a brief montage of clips. I should mention that we did also get several bits of gameplay from Sukatai, showing Indy and company exploring the river on various small boats, Indy exploring a dark canyon, and a water-based puzzle in a temple with a giant stone head. Indy's journal indicates that he is after the Blessed Pearl in this section. A map of Sukatai indicates that this area is made up of rivers connecting a village, a hidden pyramid, and other points of interest in the jungle. We also saw some brief fight footage from the Himalayan ship level, and possibly a single shot of Shanghai when we see Indy reload his revolver in an office at nighttime, with fireworks or distant explosions going off outside. Plus, the single shot of the Golden Idol chamber in the Chachapoyan Temple from Raiders that I mentioned before. Aside from that, there are no new locations revealed in this gameplay. Before we move on, I'd also like to mention that we have not seen any evidence of the branching dialogue options. This gameplay and storytelling method was prominent in the early era of Indiana Jones gaming, and many games from Bethesda and Machine Games had it as well. So far, the gameplay we have seen suggests that dialogue and cutscenes will be prompted upon taking actions, such as taking a picture of something or approaching a non-playable character. Now then, we aren't finished quite yet with this. The gameplay was preceded with a brief message from the developers and followed with a Q&A session. The intro was filmed at their motion capture studio in Uppsala, Sweden. Should be no surprise that motion capture was utilized on this project. Also, as a minor note, Indiana Jones did visit Uppsala himself in 1930 in the first issue of Indiana Jones Adventures by Dark Horse Comics. 
One of the developers talks about the long forgotten building techniques employed by ancient builders in Egypt. These are real life questions that archaeologists and historians have long pondered, with some theories tying this mystery to the Great Circle itself, and even to extraterrestrials. The developer teases the audience to wonder who were these builders, saying only that you will have to play the game to find out. Perhaps these guardians or fallen angels had something to do with it. They talk about their desire to evoke the player's sense of curiosity through authentic, detailed environments filled with secrets. They used reference photos from the 1930s to deliver authentic environments such as Sukhothai in an overgrown and unrenovated state. They showed new concept art of the Sunsparker Temple and a brilliant quad poster style piece of concept art showing Indy, Gina, the Vatican, the Himalayas, the airplane chase, the Chachapoyan fertility idol, snakes, and more. The presence of the fertility idol both in this concept art and in the original teaser trailer indicates that the Peru adventure of Raiders of the Lost Ark was always connected to this story. As for the Q&A session, the developers confirmed that the release date will be announced at Gamescom, so if you're watching this video there's a good chance that you already know what it is, but I'll be sure to mention that in the video description down below. Several recent pieces of Indiana Jones merchandise were displayed on a shelf behind them, including retro figures of Indy, Short Round, and the German Mechanic. I wonder if this could hint at Short Round being in the game? As we know, Indy will be visiting Shanghai in this game, which is set two years after Temple of Doom. And if I'm not mistaken, it came up in a prior interview that there will be other familiar characters beside Indy and Marcus. But for now, we can only hope. They also mentioned that it was a challenge, shifting from Wolfenstein to the more light-hearted tone of Indiana Jones, but that they found it fun and refreshing. They carefully studied the older Indiana Jones movies to make sure the tone of those films was correctly translated to the game. This includes the in-game animations such as Indy shaking his hand in pain after a fight, or through the dialogue and cutscenes. They described this game as being adventure heavy, as opposed to Wolfenstein which is action heavy. Since the developers knew that they could succeed with aspects like shooting that they had experience in, they first focused on unfamiliar aspects like the exploration and hand-to-hand -hand combat. In terms of amount of content, this is the biggest game machine games have ever done. There are some linear parts of the game, but there are also open world areas that allow for exploration and optional side quests. They wouldn't give a definitive answer regarding the game's length, but they said that the players would get a satisfying number of gameplay hours, especially if they explore these optional discoveries. But even if you run through the storyline, it will be longer than any game they have ever done. To put this into context, a playthrough of Wolfenstein 2 could run you anywhere between 11 and 33 hours. They said that optional side missions in the open world section of the game take time and add not minutes, but hours to the gameplay. They confirmed that first person was always the plan, citing their company's experience in that perspective and the fact that as a player they would want to be Indiana Jones and see the world through his eyes. When Indy picks up an artifact and looks at it, there is an intimacy with it being in first person. Though they also recognize that Indy needs to be on screen at times as well. Many of the developers had worked on Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, which utilized variation in gameplay and perspectives and a strong focus on character-driven storytelling, citing that game as one that established the formula that they have been following for many years. Game director Jörg Gustafsson felt that they have found the right balance, specifically mentioning that they took a lot of inspiration from classic point-and-click adventures, which made me very happy to hear. He also added that there will be options to adjust the difficulty of both the puzzles and combat. Being shot at or even firing a gun can be dangerous in this game, so the player is encouraged to think like Indy. Look at the environment and think about how you can use the tools at your disposal to avoid or outsmart an enemy. Working with Lucasfilm was a treasured resource for the development team, who had remote access to the Lucasfilm archives. I think things like the Temple of the Forbidden Eye map prove that people in Lucasfilm do care about this brand and us fans, which makes me very hopeful for the future. Similarly, the developers specifically mentioned wanting to continue Indy's arc from Raiders of the Lost Ark and fill in the gap between it and Last Crusade. 
He said that Raiders of the Lost Ark was the main reference point for the game. They were extremely happy about Troy Baker's vocal performance as Indiana Jones, saying that upon hearing his first sample, they thought it was a Harrison Ford reference audio. Baker is a huge Indiana Jones fan and was very enthusiastic about this project. They concluded the session by confirming that there would be snakes in the game. And finally, one last thing that I want to mention, they did play some of the soundtrack by Gordy Hobb. You guys have already heard most of that track in the various trailers, but I just gotta say, Gordy has done a phenomenal job. It really feels like a genuine piece of John Williams music ripped right out of Raiders of the Lost Ark or one of the adjacent films. And I noticed an unmistakable 10 second sample of Marion's theme did appear in that track. Does that mean that Marion appears? Hard to say, but I certainly wasn't expecting that. Only time will tell. Well, my friends, I think that just about wraps it up on this lengthy breakdown of everything new from Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. I think that what we saw and heard today is very encouraging, and my expectations for this game are very high right now. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on more great Indiana Jones content from me, and I'm going to put a link down below to my new Twitch account where I will eventually be streaming this game as well as here on YouTube. And of course, please let me know all of your thoughts and reactions to all of this in the comments. I'm looking forward to speculating alongside all of you for the next few months until this game is released. So, until next time my friends, thank you for watching, and I wish you all fortune and glory. Bye bye now!